My name is Ben Greisler. Uh, I was just at another presentation where the guy explained pretty much everything he did in his life outside of this. I'm not going to do that. If you're that interested in my life, you can ask me. But here I want to talk about something that impacts all of us as system administrators or people involved with the IT world in general. And I'm very happy on one hand to see so many people here uh, to listen, because I do know it's the last session on the last day, or the last group of sessions on the last day, and you all could just decide to go home early, but you decided to come here and you know spend your time with me, and hopefully I can give you some information that's going to make your life a little bit easier. But on the other hand, I've been doing DNS presentations for years now, and the reason why I first started doing DNS presentations was I discovered that there was a, a bit of a mystery when it came to DNS, and DNS in general is often done poorly. And I, I just remembered, I meant to put up another slide, uh, to make another slide, and, and I forgot to do it. But here's a question. I'll just put this out, and then we're going to discuss this a little bit later. How many people have seen... DNS server IP addresses provided by a DHCP server that starts off with like an internal DNS server, maybe a second DNS server, and then some external one, a Google one or a Verizon one or something like that. Yeah, almost everybody. Is that correct? No. So why does it keep happening? because sometimes DNS is a little bit of a mystery and people who are in charge of these things don't necessarily understand the impact of what they're doing. So on one hand, I'm really glad that you're all here. I appreciate the fact that you're here. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to be here for the rest of the event and I, there's some really good presentations out there and I really want to have the opportunity to hang out with everybody and, and network and, and just you know, meet everyone because this is, this is the first time I'm presenting here at Penn State. Uh, after years of wanting to be up here. It's the first time I've been able to arrange it, and I was only able to get here for one day, uh, but we're going to try to make this good. And because of that, I have a very, very short set of slides because I want us to talk. I want this to be about what you guys are seeing in real life, in your real organizations, in your real responsibilities. Let's talk about them, and let's figure out what a proper approach might be. Let's find out what problems you're having. Maybe you're just questioning, have I done this right? Or is there a better way of doing it? Maybe it's just a matter of, yeah, you got it. You're good. Maybe it's, all right, why don't you try this? So here's the deal. I'm going to give away uh, a copy of the uh, current latest OS 10 training book for uh, server essentials. Myself and Eric Dreher, co-authors on that. And I will give away a copy to anybody who can guess how many slides I have. No. Back row. No. No blurting. <laughs> but no, the answer is not that. Uh, Two. No, not that few. I'm getting there, though, because I'm actually trying to, I mean, I start off with like some 50-some, and it just started going doom, 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 and it all, with the hope that I'd have more time to talk with people, and it just never seemed to work out, so I really stripped it down. This gentleman right here. Five. No. White shirt. Six. Oh, everybody's working around it. Someone here? Eight. No, no. There. Four. Nope. Five. That was already said. Pay attention, it'll be a quiz. This gentleman. No. <laughs> this gentleman, right there. Ten. Ten, you win the book. Get me your address and I will mail it out to you. Don't worry, we'll give away a few more. I got a whole box of them I gotta get rid of. Uh, well, normally what happens is Eric and I have this whole list of people that we have to send it out and we get down and like, do you have any left? I think I got one. This time we, we were a little more cautious about it. Okay. So this is our agenda. Very short, 
We only have 75 minutes. We already used a few minutes of it. Um, I'm going to go through my slides just so we get the basics down. And then, really, this is going to be interactive. I do not want to make this a lecture. I want to make this a dialogue. Because I have information, and there may be more information. I guarantee you there's more information out in this audience that if we can pull it together, we can really do something good. Basically, I'll be a moderator, so to say. So that's why we're going to do the real life examples. And then finally, profit. Now, what do I mean by profit? Profit, it's actually kind of a joke because I've used this slide for a different audience. So profit literally meant profit for them. But here, how many people here work in, because I need to understand where you're coming from, um, how many people here come from an academic area? Right, makes sense. How many people here are not academic? Why does that seem like more than two halves? <laughs> are there people who have crossover? OK, a couple. All right, so in this case, what profit means for us is to make our users have a respectable experience. Because we don't want to have a situation where our users can't do their work, can't do their jobs, can't get through the day without having some sort of problem. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me people are using computers a lot nowadays. They're using data on their phones, on tablets, on any kind of device. And what is the thing that ties all those devices together? Network. How do things find one another on a network? DNS. So it's a, it's a common thread across all of it. So we just do a super quick review. So what does DNS stand for? Domain name services. What does DNS do? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a resolution system that will convert, and this is the very basic, because it can do more than that. It's been gaining additional functionality. But basically, it will convert almost a, a human-friendly name to a set of numbers. Can anybody here tell me what Apple's uh, main IP address is? <laughs> External, I'll, I'll, I'll say that. 17? Yeah, the, se the 17 range. But if I wanted to go to their main website, what's their IP address? Pom? <laughs> exactly. That, that, that's all we need to know. Right now, it's this. And he may test it again, and it may be something else. <laughs> right, so the point is, as humans, we do not remember numbers, particularly long strings of numbers, very well. But we remember phrases very well. We remember words. www.apple.com or www.catamac.com. Um, and that just makes life a lot easier for us, particularly if we know that the resource that we want to point to may change on the back end. So it's easier for us as administrators to tell our users, you need to go to www.domain.com than to say, oh, it just changed. Now you need to go to 216.235. So on and so forth. Oh, wait a second. It just changed this, just changed that. So it makes life very simple for us to make our users' lives easier. So I was just using a website as an example. What are other uses for DNS? I know this is very, very fundamental stuff, very, very basic stuff, but bear with me. Where else do we find DNS absolutely critical? Yeah, how do we get to our mail servers? Because email, personally, I think it may be a fad, but it seems to be hanging around a little bit longer. Network printers. Host names for, for the network. Computers. Service discovery. And that's a, that's a really important one that's getting more, used more and more and more and more. Ah, that's the big one. Although, interestingly, a little less important than what it was even a couple of years ago. So what he said was, 
authentication servers. How many people here are responsible, either directly or indirectly, for some sort of authentication service? Okay, what, what might, give me some examples of what that might be. Radius, Active Directory, Open Directory. How many people are here still running OD systems? Yeah, okay. <laughs> LDAP systems. All right, everybody who runs Active Directory, put your hands up. And from you, how many of you are running LDAP? I like that you put both hands up because if you look all the way down to the core of, of Active Directory, you still have LDAP under there. So this is really important because almost everything that you would do in an internal network results in some sort of DNS lookup. If your DNS is slow or it's incorrect, things get miserable. How many people here have worked a help desk? How many people here no longer work on a help desk? How many people here are really, really happy they're no longer working on a help desk? And if you are still working on a help desk, wish you weren't. Right, why? Because all you hear are problems. Are people happy to talk to you? No. So it makes your day kind of miserable. I saw one hand go. Um, right, so I know, working in some of the environments that I've been in, one of the most popular complaints was, I can't log in, or it's taking too long to log in. Yeah. Common issue? You guys run into that before? What is a popular reason why that happens? Well, DNS isn't working. It all revolves with DNS. And Kerberos isn't working. OK. All right. I'm holding my tongue on that one, but it's kind of true. Um, so here's the deal. We have to make sure things work so we don't get those complaints. So that's great for us. That's great for the user because they don't have a complaint. And that's an issue. All right, moving on. Has anybody seen this diagram before? I specifically, I actually had my own diagram that I used to use. And I decided, no, you know what? Let me, let me go take a look around. And I found this. This is on the TechNet site from Microsoft, who has traditionally done everything they possibly could, not necessarily intentionally, but um, they've really screwed up DNS for a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even being facetious. Uh, the reason is that, and think back a bunch of years, now, looking around, I think that there's a few people here. If they thought back a few years, they'd be teenagers. Um, not everybody's an old guy like me. But if you think back a few years, how important was DNS to Microsoft networks? Yeah, it really wasn't that critical. Why? They, yeah, they had other ways of providing that resource uh, uh, resolution. But when, so what's kind of the trigger for Microsoft to all of a sudden go, hey, you know what, we kind of really need to make this work? What, what occurred and what's continuing to occur? Yeah, things are on the outside, because what's, what's the name of this session? DNS, the inside and the outside. So we're seeing more of a situation where uh, we need to get to our resources, just not within our, our little world, you know, within our, our, our gateway, or even just across our, our campus. But we have to get to stuff that's everywhere now. And we expect to be able to get to our data no matter where it's at. So we have to be a little more cognizant of, of how this occurs. Now, I'm not picking on Microsoft because they don't know what they're doing. They very well knew what they were doing. They were very good at it. Sometimes it was a pain in the butt as admins to deal with it, but they're good. They know what they were doing, and they did it very well for what they intended it to do. 
But once we started getting into sort of the, the broader world where everybody just wanted to get to their data, no matter where they're at. Okay, I mean, how many people here have their own internal network at work? Of course. How many people here needed to access data on it while you were here? Yes. Okay. So what is this diagram? What is it telling us? This is basically how DNS lookups, or the process of doing the name resolution, works. There's two important pieces of information that even um, a lot of experienced system admins, they, they may know it, but they don't necessarily know to put a name on it. There's two important pieces of information here. The concept of the recursive query and the iterative uh, uh, query. And we need to understand this when we're dealing with DNS lookups that are going to occur in multiple places. So what does that mean to us? Well, like I said, we just need to know how this works. Because if we're going to be in charge of making sure that our users can get to resources, we need to know how that's going to happen. Now, I'll also point this out here. I, this, this I did remember to, to add. Can you guys actually read that? It looks a little, even, a little soft from even up here. So it, it references dot .local. Now, if you're a Mac admin, dot .local is a terrible, horrible thing. And what, what technically is dot .local when we're talking about dot .locals? Now, I am making an assumption that you guys, you know, certain things that I'm talking about, you, you understand. If you have any questions later, get me offline, no problem. We'll talk through it, no sweat whatsoever. So what, what is dot .local? What would we consider dot .local? <laughs> yes, but besides that, it's a top-level domain. It's basically anything kind of at the end, that's the very top-level domain. Like we also have .govs, .com, .net. Where else do we see .local other than kind of legacy uh, Microsoft networks? Bonjour. Thank you. <laughs> or rendezvous or zero conf, whatever you want to decide to, to, to call it. Does everybody remember when Apple had to switch from rendezvous to bonjour? Does anybody remember why? Right, they got sued for the name. Does anybody remember who sued them? I'll give away, uh, I'll give away another book if you know this one. No Google, that would be cheating. All right, somebody get close to who it is? No, no, no. No, honestly, I'll just say, it was a company that I was unfamiliar with at the time. It's a company called Tibco. Tibco is a financial software firm, which unless you were in the financial field, you probably never heard of them. So their argument that there could be confusion between Apple's rendezvous and their Rendezvous was really kind of far-fetched, but I actually met the guy and worked with the guy who started that whole thing for Tibco. And we all looked at him. He was very proud of himself, and we're like, yeah. Um, but okay. What information does a client device need to have to start looking up a mail server, a website, an Active Directory, uh, service? A name server. How is that name server provided to them? Somehow. Exactly. I like that answer. You get a book. Make sure I get your address. Um, all right, so DHCP, static config. I mean, I know my first experience with DNS was simply it was a bunch of numbers that I needed to put into this box. I had no clue what it did, but that's what I did many, many years ago. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there still doing it. All right, so they have that IP address. Well, here's a question for you. How come we have to provide 
the clients with an IP address and maybe not, you know, a fully qualified domain name for the Who's DNS server. Fully qualified domain name without an IP? Right, exactly. How are they supposed to look it up? Right, so we have an IP address. And on the computer or what device that's trying to find out that information, we have a resolver, a little piece of code that resides in the operating system that goes, hey, DNS server, I'm looking for, in this case, www.whitehouse.gov. Great. So it goes to the DNS server that it was told to talk to. Does that DNS server have an answer for it? Maybe. The answer is maybe. It might be cached because somebody else asked it. It might be the official uh, server, DNS server, that has all the information, particularly if it's an internal server. And it could just say, here you go. This is the information. And that would be a recursive query. The resolver asks the question. The DNS server is able to answer it for him. Boom. And everybody's happy. What if it doesn't have the answer? What happens next? Well, OK. So a couple things could happen. So first answer is, it might just fail. It just might go, I don't know. And that is actually what separates an iterative from recursive. A recursive will respond with either the answer or I don't know. It fails. It doesn't give anything back. That's very important. Okay, so keep that in mind. The other possibility is, I, I keep having to dodge back that way because I'm getting the glare from the projector. Um, the other possibility is the name server goes, hmm, I don't know. Or the last time I did have that answer was too long ago. Because typically, it's not a guarantee, but typically a DNS server, any answer it does get back, it will kind of keep in memory, keep in its cache for a certain amount of time that is defined by the SOA. What does SOA stand for? Start of, authority. start of authority. What is the start of authority for a domain? What does that actually mean? It's, yeah, it contains, it's the server that contains the official information on that domain. And part of that information is going to be, you are allowed to cache this information for X period of time. How long typically would we want to cache DNS information before it goes away? So the answer is, depends. What does it depend on? That's really what we're getting to is, uh, if it's something that has a tendency to change a lot, maybe an hour. If it's something that's not going to change for a long, long time, it might be days. The problem is, let's say you do need to change the DNS information, but you've set, you know, because you're authoritative, you're in charge of this domain, and you've set, excuse me, um, the, the SOA, the, or excuse me, the time to live to a week. How long maximum are you going to have to wait before everybody in the world will get the new correct information? 13 days. <laughs> Actually, could be any one of those. It's going to be at least seven days. Might be shorter, could be longer, because some clever guy may have decided that, oh, even though the start of authority says the time to live is seven days, I don't want to have that load on my DNS server, so I'm going to let it live for a month. So basically, the time to live is a suggestion. Most DNS servers pay attention to it, so that's good. All right. So now the name server goes, I don't have that information, so I'm going to go out and look for this information. Where does it look? Forwarders. <laughs> ah, forwarders. What's a forwarder? Well, a forwarder is where a particular DNS server 
is told to look if it doesn't have the information. But now, different things can happen depending on what DNS servers it's been told to forward to. It could be just yet some other DNS server, like, a, um, uh, like your ISPs. But let's say we finally get to a point where it goes, I don't have a clue. Where is it going to go? The roots. How does it know where to find these root servers? Yeah, it's, it's built in to, it, it's a file that literally has a list of them. So if this file is built in, well, wouldn't you think that maybe that could change on a regular basis? It, technically, yes, it could change. Typically, it's pretty static. How many root servers are there? 13. Well, so here's the thing, though. So it's 13 DNS servers. Does that mean there's actually just 13 boxes out there? No. No. It's, it's distributed, but somebody's looking for one particular one. It could actually be answered by one of many uh, actual physical servers. Because do you think that 13 DNS servers could actually support the entire world? <laughs> With a lot of caching. With a lot of caching. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it was kind of a cheater question because the answer was up there. Um, who controls, and this is really important, who controls those 13 root servers? I can. Who used to? Yeah. Depart Whose Department of Commerce? We'll go that far. US. US. So theoretically, who controlled the internet? <laughs> Right, so now we have an independent organization, supposedly independent organization, controlling the internet. If somebody wanted to set up their own DNS system, could they do that? Absolutely. How many people here are set up your own DNS system? Yeah, exactly. Why couldn't you do that on a global scale? Absolutely you could. Do you need separate fiber? Do you need separate copper? Do you need separate interconnects? No, because it all just goes over the same physical layer, right? So just think about that. <laughs> Do you think it's already happening? Yeah. yeah. So I just bring that up because uh, next week I was supposed to speak at Mac IT, but I had to, I had to cancel on that one. And actually, I was going to discuss more uh, DNS security. And it was just going to be one of the things that we're going to be talking about. But just something to keep in mind. But in general, for DNS, what we're talking about in the greater world is what we traditionally think of as our regular internet. Okay, so it goes up to the name server. What does the name server know? Does the name server know where uh, White House or www.whitehouse.gov is? No. So what? Why is it useful? Why are we talking to it? Right. It knows top level domains. So it goes. Oh, you want a .gov domain? Here is where you're going to find the answer to top-level domains. So it shoots it down to the next uh, DNS server, and it checks in with that. So does the next level domain server that has the .govs, does it know where www.whitehouse.gov is? No. No. What does it know? White right. It knows White House. So then it answers back, well, you need to go talk to the DNS server that knows about whitehouse.gov. It knows the domain. And then finally, you get to the one that handles whitehouse.gov, and does it know www.whitehouse.gov? <laughs> we hope. But, you know. yeah, it all came down to whether, how much coffee the, the DNS admin had that morning when they wanted to put in something really, really important. All right, so it goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So the name server actually has to assemble all that information to finally get through that iterative query the answer. And now, instead of failing, it can give an answer to the resolver 
for the client. So in the amount of time that it had, you know, took us to, to go through this whole process, you could have done millions and millions of actual lookups, because this all happens pretty quickly, you hope. Because uh, one thing that I would often run into is where we would get delays in DNS lookups, either due to network issues. Um, how many people here in your organization have dedicated DNS servers? They do nothing but DNS. Good. That's the way it ought to be. But servers are expensive. I need my servers to do more than one thing. Hear that all the time also. How many people here, how many people here administer or continue to administer OS 10 servers? Okay. How many people here remember when you would get that whole column in the, the, the server administration uh, app where you'd have every single service listed? Every single one of them had a green, red, or yellow dot next to it. <laughs> and then you talk to the person who set this up and you go, what does this server do? And they go, oh, that's our, that's our file server. Why do you have this, 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 and this running on it? I don't know. But you know, they'll say, yeah, but it's not really doing that. But it's still running in the background. It's still doing something. It's still waiting. It's still whatever. So you can run into situations where you get that. Or how many people here go, well, you know, we don't run individual servers. We have virtual machines. How many people here run a, a virtual? Yeah, OK. Great, wonderful, beautiful things. Uh, quick story, I was at a client that I was brought into strictly because they were getting poor performance on their file services for Apple devices. Reality was when I got there, they were having poor uh, uh, file behavior uh, or speed on all their devices, Windows, Mac, whatever they had there. But honestly, the Windows people didn't know to complain about it. And it was <laughs> mostly because the people who on the Windows side were doing, you know, typically they'd have this huge Excel spreadsheet open, and that's all they'd have open all day. And they wouldn't really notice, whereas the people on the Macs were in and out of files much more. So it just it, it hit them more. But they didn't realize that this problem was actually across the board. So talking to the sysadmin there, and I'm like, well, you know, show me what you have. And he shows me this really nice rack of HP servers. He goes, yeah, we put these in about six months ago, and they're really awesome, and it's best of everything, and it's wonderful, and it's got you know a bazillion cores, and a, and, a, and a, it's got memory and fast sand behind it. It's great. I'm like, okay, good. And how much RAM do you have in these things? Twelve gigs. <laughs> huh? <laughs> how many VM instances are you running on each one of these boxes? He goes, well, it depends. Could anywhere be from six to twelve? Huh? <laughs> but in his mind, 12 gigs of RAM was a huge amount. And it's like, all right, fine. So this is a case where even though they had some VMs that were set up just to do one job, the, the, the hypervisor was just so choked for resources that there was no way that they were going to get good performance on anything. So just something to be aware of. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit more about this and get back to this later. All right, so what do we need to, to do when we want to plan? And, and trust me, I'm going through this whole thing. We're going to all come back to stuff and wrap this up. Um, when we want to put together a DNS system, what do we need to start thinking about? This is a very open question. There's not any one specific answer. Yeah, number of clients you're going to have to deal with. Yeah, to have to deal with. Where are they at? Yeah, maybe what OS they have, although that should be fairly agnostic. No, I mean, OS for the server. Oh, OS for the server, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you guys work together? No. I thought maybe that was an in-joke or something. Like, you don't have to worry about that. That's my job, that type of thing. All right, so these are really the two big ones, and everything kind of kind of cascades off of that. So where are your clients? And then where are your servers? Why is this important? And we are getting to something that's kind of the the the, the whole gist of of what we're 
latency because right okay but what if you've got clients that are outside of your LAN but they need to have access to things on your LAN what if they're inside your LAN need to access stuff outside your LAN which is actually kind of a very traditional thing you know I need to get to my file server I need to get to my printers I need to get to my um, you know, whatever it is I need to get to, I'm inside my LAN, I need to get to it, it's uh, inside with me, but I also need to go to certain websites on the outside world. So I will have my devices check in with the local DNS server that will handle all the lookups for me and then give me the information. And if it happens to be on the outside world, it will give me the outside IP address and I'll go find it that way. We'll get there. What if they're on the outside world and they need to get to inside to get to some sort of resource? How do you handle that? A VPN? How do they find the VPN? You give them the IP address or do you give them a fully qualified domain name? Right, so how does their VPN take that fully qualified domain name and, right, so, Here's the deal. So we've got your, your firewall, or let's just call this your gateway. And I know this is very basic, but once again, foundational. So we've got internal DNS server, external DNS server. Um, in other versions of this, I actually showed the resources down there, but things got kind of, kind of clogged up. So it's real simple. You need to make sure that no matter what side of the firewall your users are on, they need to be able to find the information from whatever DNS server they can reach. So it's simple when you're on the inside because you have your own DNS servers, you can put whatever records in there that you need, right? They get it and they get the information, that's wonderful. But how do you tell something on the outside world what one of your inside devices are besides VPN? Because Frankly, VPN's usefulness for a lot of situations is kind of sort of petering out. And for good reason, because we have other ways of safely de delivering data without having to go through uh, that type of connection. It's still very useful in a lot of situations, but we've, we've got choices now. So how do, we, how do we make that work? Yeah, serve the DNS record to the internet. So does that mean I'm going to go find an external DNS server and say um, radius.education.edu is at 172.16.3.1? Right, that can't work. So how do you make it work? Well, we've already talked about it. I just didn't say the word, but... Um, basically what it means is, well, yeah, you, you need to provide your external IP address for your internal server. But my internal server, server has an IP address of 172.16.x.x. .x. What's that? <laughs> yeah, but it's got to serve people both inside and outside. So if I put it outside, then the people inside have to go outside. If the people outside need to come inside, yeah, I could do poor forwarding. I could do one-to-one -one NAT. I could do any one of a number of, of firewall tricks to be able to get the data to come through. All right, so we're going to vote on popularity of what he just said. So what he just said was, or you can have two servers. How many admins in here want to administer two servers that do the same thing? Any hands? No, I'm not picking on you. Because actually, on one way, that actually could be a brilliant solution if you had a way of replicating your data across both devices. I do different things with my external DNS server. You do different things with your internal versus your external DNS servers. Yeah. Give me an example. I, well, external queries are routed based on where they're coming from sometimes. Okay, external queries are routed based on where they're coming from. Interesting concept. Hold that thought, yeah? I don't have the infrastructure to provide for the queries for them. 
Okay. So I'll, this is just a little sidebar thing. So interesting, interesting situation. What he said was, my external DNS server treats the query different based on where it's coming from. So do you basically have one DNS server or maybe a group of DNS servers that are basically handling both internal and external and just giving the answer based on where it came from? Okay. Okay. So you're using somebody else's DNS service to host. Okay. And that's a very traditional, typical way of dealing with it. But where I was getting to, because I, I was kind of hoping you'd go down this path. Has anybody heard of the, the concept of views? One, two, three, couple, couple of hands. So a view is a really clever thing built into bind that simply looks at the IP address that the request came from, and it could recognize whether it was internal, external, or just wherever, and give an answer based on the originating IP address. In theory, you could have one DNS server or cluster DNS servers that serve both internal and external. But here's the gotcha, and, and somebody said it, I don't have the infrastructure to handle the traffic that might come through. I mean, if, if you're Penn State, I could, there's probably somebody here who could answer it. How many hits a day do you get on the main website? I guess there's no one here from Penn State that can answer that. <laughs> but it's probably a huge number, or, or whitehouse.gov. You know, your poor little Mac Mini that you're using for your DNS server, which is actually a fairly nice machine with a SSD in there for, you know, like basically a DNS appliance, poor thing would probably melt down with that kind of activity. So views are great, particularly inside where you might have a large campus environment. But okay, so kind of going back. Um, right, so the answer is, with our DN external DNS server, it doesn't necessarily have to be ours. It could be hosted, it could be our ISPs, it could be whoever we have access to, Amazon. There are a lot of external DNS providers. Almost all of the registrars provide DNS. You tell the start of authority what DNS servers are, are authoritative for your domain and you can put in there the external IP address of your internal resource, if it is internal, and then your firewall handles the routing of the request of, for the data at that point. Now, I asked the question just a few minutes ago, how many people here want to manage two servers with essentially the same data on it and no one raised their hand? So now you're telling me, Ben, that that's exactly what I need to do? Well, yes, you need to manage two servers, but it's not the same information because it is different answers. And that's just the way that it, that it works. Could you be clever and have your own with using views and all that? Absolutely. And you know what? If you're a big enough organization, I'll bet you Penn State probably does it that way. Anybody here from Penn State can answer that? Nope. All right. Worth asking. Or no, actually, is there anybody here from Penn State? Okay, but you guys aren't involved with the DNS. Okay, excellent. All right, here we go. Real life scenarios. This is where you guys get involved because actually the next slide is simply discussion and Q&A. But we've got about a half hour. Let's talk about this. What do you want to know what issues are you running into? Why did you come here to talk about or to listen to? Because you probably came here to listen about DNS. Now I'm asking you to talk about DNS. When am I going to have to start putting IPv6 records in my DNS? <sighs> All right, so the question is, actually, I'm sorry. We were supposed to um, pass a microphone around so we could record this. Uh, we could still do that, or I could just repeat questions, whatever. Okay, I'll repeat the questions. So the question was, when do I need to start putting IPv6 
records into my DNS server. Now, everybody noticed how cleverly I ignored both IPv4 and 6 by name, although I was showing an example with IPv4. You probably want to start thinking about it now. But that is really only if you've got resources that are addressed via IPv6. How many people here are using IPv6 right now? Okay. How many, let me ask it this way. How many people here are utilizing networks that have IPv6 on them, even if you're not physically pumping in an IPv6 address? Everybody raise your hand, because that's the answer. Whether you know it or not, most of the backbone data right now is being carried via IPv6 addressing. Uh, there was a very interesting presentation at Mac IT last year by a friend of mine who's been working for Cisco, I don't know, 20 years or so. And he's actually in the group in Cisco um, that's been helping the industry do the IPv IPv6 transition. And he explained what IPv6 is being used for. And this was last year, and it's only gotten bigger. And there were a lot of jaws open. If you've got, if you're in an area that has Comcast, chances are your your box is getting an IPv6 address. Sometimes only an IPv6, IPv6 address. Uh, cellular data, a lot of times, could be IPv6. So, yes, we need to recognize the fact that we're going to have to deal with IPv6, but only if we actually have resources that are set up as IPv6 resources. So that's the answer. If you've got servers or resources of any type that have IPv6 addressing, it should be in. Uh -huh. But I don't really know when one is going to dictate in IPv6 router. Ah, so what he said was he's got records for both. So what's what's an IPv6 forward lookup type? What's the record uh, called? Quad A. Quad A. A A A A. What is it for IPv4? A. A. Why wasn't it A A or A A A? I don't know. Somebody wanted to make a point. Um, so the answer to your question is, it depends on what the client is going to ask for. So depending on the client, it may ask for quad A before it asks for just a regular A record. Anybody have an example of a device? And when I say device, device could be anything that's connected to your network. It could be your refrigerator at this point. What device may be likely to ask for a quad A record? Back to my Mac. Almost anything from Apple nowadays is probably going to try quad A right off the bat. The question is how long it takes before it gives up if it doesn't find one, because that has been a bit of an issue. So once again, you could get into a latency issue. Okay, how many people here have been experimenting with IPv6? How many people here know who Hurricane Electric is? Okay, when you get out of here and you're totally bored one day, look up Hurricane Electric and go sign up for their IPv6 training. Very useful. They have their own little uh, certification too, which is kind of neat to have. Actually, I never finished it, but it's... The, the, the quizzes and the information that they have, very, very useful for IPv6. Okay, other questions? It, it's strange. We're, we're using, utilizing Split DNS. Okay. All of our website is hosted at Amazon. Okay. Via load balancer. Okay. Um, our external DNS is a service. They provide something they call an A name record. It okay. allows you to take a root domain. And alias it to and, and basically use it as a C as a C name instead of an IP address. Okay. Which is what Amazon requires. Okay. So if somebody goes to domain.com, they get forwarded to www. No, they, or, they actually get served the load balancer C name. Oh, okay. All right. Amazon only provides a FQDM for 
their their balancer. Gotcha. All right. Gotcha. How can I do that on an internal server? Okay. So let me let me rephrase that. How can I internally provide a load balanced DNS solution? No, it's not the load balancing DNS. So you're not concerned about the load balancing itself? How can I provide a C name, a fully, uh, a fully qualified domain name, when the request is <laughs> domain.com and not www.domain.com? Because it breaks. You put yeah. it into the, into what, the what is, what is direct. It, it stops functioning. You mean Apple's DNS server? Yeah, Apple's DNS server. Um, Apple's DNS server is bind. It's yeah, it's, it's straight up bind. Yeah. It's actually even gotten even more straight up with the latest revs. Um, I don't know. I don't have any issues assigning a record. Their, their GUI is domain. completely broken. I don't broken like GUI, it, but it works. OK, it may be something maybe you need to hand Okay. Contact me offline because I'm kind of kind of interested. That falls into I wonder if. So I don't have a direct answer for that because that's yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about your other scenarios. How many people here have users out there using mobile devices to reach your internal uh, resources? Actually, I'm surprised that not everybody has their hand up for that one, because that really seems to be the way that it goes. What issues are you running into with that? Authentication. Authentication. So what, what, what happens? Um, sometimes when you log in, they, they, can't, they can't get in, or they can't resolve the VPN connection they use your mobile phone. So. OK. So that okay. So what she said was um, people are having problems actually accessing uh, or authenticating through the VPN. That could be a billion different uh, possibilities because if they're actually reaching your VPN, then then the lookup is is happening successfully. What's happening after that fact would be between the uh, VPN server and. Oh, it can't resolve the VPN name. Well, that's another story. So where do you host your the the, the main information for your VPN? Yeah. Internal. Internal. But if they're in the outside world, how do they get that? They go to like www.domain.com. Oh, and so they go they go through like an SSL VPN yeah. at that point? Yeah. Well, if they're going so they can't resolve that? Oh, sometimes they can, sometimes they can't. Ah, all right. So this is actually something that I, I've bumped into a few times, where you get you, you try to reach a resource, and this could happen both internally and externally. One moment you can reach it, the next moment you can't. What might be happening? Evil cell phone companies. <laughs> snarky but true. And snarky enough that give me your, your address, I'll send you a book for that. I like that. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes you can't trust the DNS from certain providers. So I'm not going to name any names, but uh, how many people here have to deal with Comcast? Uh, I like how many people here? Love Comcast's services, and they're just excellent when it comes to DNS and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I'll give them 50% because they're better than Time Warner. 50% because they're better than Time Warner. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Well. <laughs> All right, so here's, here's the issue. There are a number of very poor uh, DNS providers out there. I have found Comcast, because I'm in an area that Comcast is real big in. And anytime that I go into an environment 
and I see that they're using the Comcast uh, DNS servers, even if I have to move them to Google's, it's going to be a better solution for them. So sometimes the situation just may simply be whose DNS servers they're, they're using. But that leads to an interesting situation. If I'm at home, or I'm at the office, or someplace where I've got control of my network, not necessarily the main, you know, main office network, but you know, just someplace where I can go, you know what, I've got Comcast, they're really crappy, they're very laggy, I'm just gonna use somebody else's DNS, and, and I'll, even if I just set up my own DNS server to act as a caching server, um, at least I have control over it. But if somebody's traveling, and, and they're going from hotel to hotel to hotel, and they're going through various um, networks, how do you guarantee that the DNS that they're going to get is actually halfway decent? OK. So what he's suggesting is to <laughs> test it out. How many people here, after you're done uh, administrating your two servers with the same information on it, want to have your users have to run Namebench to test their DNS. Yeah, you, you don't. It's great for us, but for your average user, they don't give a rat's talk us about that, right? So what can you do? Real life. I mean, somebody calls you up, listen, sometimes I'm in, sometimes I'm not. It Sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't. I got this report I got to do. I got I to gotta connect to something. What are you going to tell them? What's that? Host file. Well, that's certainly a possibility in some cases. What's that? Right. So one of the things you could do is say, listen, I know this is a pain, but go here, go here, go here. Do you see that slot? Yeah, put in this number. All right, good. Give me a call back in five minutes if, if, if this has, hasn't helped you. But the reality, and now here's the question. Say if they go someplace else that that won't work at anymore. And this is a real life situation. How many people here have been on any of the Apple campuses? Okay. Now, I think they've changed this maybe within the past year. But prior to that, if you put in your own DNS server, when I say your own, I mean, if you just decide, oh, I don't want to use Apple's DNS server, or I have a, a DNS server hard-coded, into my network setup. Guess what? In Apple, you weren't going to get name resolution. You had to use all DNS requests, had to go through Apple's DNS servers on their network. Okay. So in theory, that person you just helped when they get to their next location, now they're not getting online at all. And it may not necessarily be very evident or obvious what the problem is. Because you say, hey, do me a favor, pull up terminal and type in the word ping and here's an IP address and they do that and it pings. So they've got network connectivity, but they're not getting anywhere. All of a sudden, oh yeah, wait a second, uh, two days ago I gave you this, go in there, pull it out. So once again, it's just realizing where the pieces lie and what you need to, to fix. So here's a situation for you. If you've got your start of authority set up correctly, if you have your time to live in a reasonable number. So here's another possibility. If for some reason the IP address of her uh, VPN server changed, but somewhere, you know, let's say, five, ten years ago, when they set up that domain, uh, the start of authority for it, maybe it's been, you know, it's just old enough that it's been out there for a long time, when the internet was slow, laggy, full of latent, uh, latency, and computing time was expensive, you may have given a very long time to live. So, when your device makes a request for an IP address for a, a fully qualified domain name, if one moment it's talking to a server that has the right information, it works. But two seconds later, 
it's doing, it needs to do another resolution, maybe it hits a server that doesn't have the right information, has old information or something along those lines. So the time to live becomes very, very important, particularly if you've got resources that the backing IP changes frequently or could be frequently or is a pool of devices. Right. So say the Mac um, user is trying to log into their computer and for some reason it just keeps spinning and could not log them into the computer. Right. It's that that is a very common issue. But my PCs log in like this. Exactly. So it's your Macs. <laughs> How many people have heard that? <laughs> Been personally on the on the end of that. Right. So the, 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 the statement was, PC seemed to log in great, Macs just spin and spin and spin, probably sometimes it works eventually, right. sometimes you have to try it again, and that's probably because the Windows devices are being told where their authentication uh, source is in a different manner than straight up DNS. Wins. Wins. Yeah. Net buoy. All right. So, I'll tell a, a quick story. We were down to 14 minutes. Um, I was doing, so anybody here from University of Maryland? Well, I attend. Oh, you attend there. Okay. Main <laughs> campus, uh, yeah, go Tarpons, all that kind of thing. So it's, it's an amazing campus down there. I'd never been on their campus until I had to go down and, and work with them on a whole stack of servers and an XSAN backing for all of it. It was really kind of an impressive setup. And we had to do an AD integration. We had to get all of these X serves running OS 10 server, or I forget what version, authenticating against their, their Active Directory. So I get everything set up. I'm, I'm trying to do the bind. And it would be, now I've got 13 servers that I need to get connected. And it would be like failed attempt, failed attempt, failed attempt, failed attempt. And I just keep trying, keep trying, keep trying, because that is the definition of insanity of trying the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different result. And guess what? It would bind. One machine might bind the first time. Another machine may have taken me 12 times before it finally bound. And it would work. It would be OK. So what was happening? Well, for some crazy reason, they, meaning the admins, the network admins, blocked um, all the required ports for Active Directory binding from OS 10 to all of their uh, uh, um, domain controllers, except for one that was on a campus like someplace else. Because I'd done all these tests, and I, I basically told them, listen, I can't reach any of these, but this one I can. And I gave them the IP address. And they're like, oh, yeah, we got to fix this. I'm on a conference call. We got to fix this. OK, great. So we're going to be able to bind. He goes, no, 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 you should have never been able to bind. <laughs> dead silence, dead silence, dead silence. What? He goes, yeah, you need to tell us what the IP address is of the devices that you want to have bound to our AD so we can actually punch them through for you. Oh, that would have been good information to have like a day ago. <laughs> but they were very happy because I found a problem with their system that they fixed, which meant now you couldn't do something, but all right, fine. Go Terrapins. Um, but here's the other thing. When I first started doing the testing to be able to bind to Active Directory, and here's the really great thing. I'm binding to Active Directory less and less and less nowadays. I mean, I, spend, I used to spend a lot of time making a lot of money helping people bind Apple environments to their Microsoft. And I'm just not doing it as much anymore because we don't need to have that kind of binding anymore because we're getting our data through different means. But here's the issue. I would go, and one of the first things I do when I need to bind to Active Directory is, all right, what's your domain? Our domain is company.com. That's our AD domain. Great. Host, 
blah, 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 company.com. And I get all these replies, and they're all domain controllers, and they're all around the world. And that's great, because depending on where you're at, hopefully, if their network is set up right and their domain controllers are set up right, I will bind to and use one of their local domain controllers. And all that information is given out using service records, which we didn't talk that much about. But that's how services can be discovered using traditional DNS. You actually say, your, your Kerberos records are, are here, your, your AD is over there, this is where you need to look for it. And it's great, it's wonderful, it can be kind of confusing by the, the, the nomenclature that they use, but it's there. But I'm looking through and I start seeing IP addresses in this list that says 169.254. something something. <laughs> Has anybody else seen this in DNS? So <clears throat> a good friend of, of ours, Doug Hanley, uh, Doug and I used to present on um, uh, DNS at, at Macworld, Mac IT, and uh, do a lot of work together. Uh, he was, I saw this a lot and I couldn't quite understand what was going on until one day he goes, hey, you know what? I just saw this again and I finally figured it out why we're seeing these 169.254s. So I was at a client and he was doing the testing. And what it was, and, and this has proven to be true every single time that I've seen it, you go, you set up your Windows server, and you went to Dell, you went to HP, you went to whoever, and you were able to get this four port NIC in it, and you go and you plug in two Ethernet cables and it left two open. What you didn't do was go and shut off those NICs. So what happened was, when you did everything you were supposed to do, you had two of those NICs not being able to get IP addresses. I'm sorry, the, the other two were plugged in, but they weren't plugged into ports that were actually active. So it saw the ports as lit up, but it couldn't, couldn't get an IP address via DHCP. It didn't have an IP address assigned to it. So it went, oh, it must be 169.254. whatever, whatever. And guess what? When you set that machine up as a domain controller, it dutifully registers those IP addresses. So here's the gotcha. And this is another reason why sometimes you get this works, this works, it doesn't, it doesn't, it does, it doesn't, it does, 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 doesn't, doesn't. Because functionally it's wrong information. So there's a couple different types of wrong information. There's wrong information that was right at some point, and there's wrong information that just doesn't exist anymore, or just never existed correctly. Does anybody run into that type of thing? Okay. All right, so seven minutes. What else do we have? What else do we have? How, who does? Cloudflare. Cloudflare? I, I can't really talk on that. Yeah. So the, the question was, can you talk about Cloudflare and how they, they deal with security? I would be, I don't necessarily want to act like I'm expert on exactly what they're doing. We did not talk about the, the, how important reverse lookups are. I'm not skipping your thing, but this is important. So reverse lookups, I mean, we, we kind of skipped over the entire discussion of all the different types of lookups that we have out there. And actually, reverse lookups do go to a little bit to security. So what is a reverse lookup? Well, we've talked about an A record. A record is, you know, fully qualified domain to IP address. Reverse lookup is IP address to fully qualified domain name. So it's reverse. But what is, what's so important about it? Because he's right. It's absolutely critical in a lot of cases. True. So, okay, so one, yes, machines don't know names. They just know numbers. Secondly, and from a security standpoint, it's used often as a double check for email for spam, it says it's coming from here, but the IP says it's coming from there. So this potentially is a mismatch. 
but also in the world of Active Directory and Open Directory for on the OS X side, everything ends up being a reverse lookup too. And if your reverse lookups aren't in place, you can get a lot of failures. Another interesting thing, because I would go into a lot of uh, Microsoft houses and say, all right, I need uh, you know records for this, 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 and this. And the guy would be, yeah, no problem. And I say, and I need a reverse lookup. Uh, you know, I need reverse record also. Yeah, yeah, no problem. You check off the box. How many people here are familiar with the interface? OK, so there's a box that says make a reverse, you know, reverse uh, uh, record, a pointer record for what I'm putting in as an A record. Oh, wonderful, check. And then I'll go and I'll check, and it's not there. And then the guy looks all confused. And then finally I realized, ah, unless you already have the reverse zone in place, Microsoft does not automatically make that zone to put the, the record in. As opposed to an OS X server, if you, it, it just, it automatically does it for you. It assumes that if you need a forward lookup, you're going to need a reverse also. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay. Four minutes. Okay. And with the file server on your site, that goes out of the way. Um, and you wanted to keep the domain name the same for that respective service. Okay. But point them to a different service on your application. Ah, okay. So, great question. Uh, the example was I've got four different locations. I want to keep one uh, fully qualified domain name. And when that, when that is requested, it gets pointed to the appropriate. Uh, server. This is just a, a beautiful uh, um, need that would be answered by views, because that's exactly what views do. Okay, it came from this IP address. The request came from this IP address. I'm going to send it over here. You know, I, I'm in a, it, it's a Los Angeles area or whatever. You know, you, you can kind of figure, you know, geolocate via IP. And say, all right, all this goes here, all this goes there. So that's that's one way of doing it. Um, follow up question to that is um, at least in the research, small amount of research I've done with um, regarding views, does Microsoft DNS support that in any way or have some sort of similar capability? Good question. I'm not sure. Maybe somebody in the audience knows. Does, I, I want to say no, but I, I can't say that authoritatively. Does Microsoft DNS services provide views functionality? Crickets. So the answer is, none of us in this room know. But my, my gut feeling is telling me, no, it doesn't. Everything I've seen, it seems to be no. But I don't really have the option of moving to find, for example, the different factor records. OK. And, Yeah, what's, I mean, well, it actually kind of depends on what, um, what's the resource they're trying to reach? 51 seconds. <laughs> 46, 45. No, I mean, is it for like AD use or something else? No, I mean, it, it's something we have a few different services that we'd like to put in each of our buildings, but we can't right now because of that problem. Okay, because things like sites might actually work for stuff that sites are actually designed for it. Okay. It'd be like AD and stuff yeah, like that. I was thinking more like file service, like web service or stuff. Yeah. Um, no. Distributed file system might take care of part of it for yeah, file stuff. That's something we looked at. I think I think Mac used for that, right? Sort of kind of mostly <laughs> test it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, zero. So I'll still hang out for a little bit if anybody has any additional questions. Thank you very much. I hope this was useful to you.